um, the President tweeted earlier today that uh, most politicians would have gone into the meeting like the one Don Jr. attended in order to get info on an opponent. He said that's politics. His FBI director nomination, nominee said that uh, anyone who was approached by a hostile government uh, for opposition research should contact the FBI rather than taking the meeting. Uh, who's right? And, and what's the White House's position on whether or not it's okay to meet with a hostile government for opposition research? Well, look, you know I'm not going to get into the specifics of this, uh, but I will say that um, that is quite often for people who are given information during the heat of a campaign uh, to, to ask what that is. Uh, that's what simply he did. The president's made it clear through his tweet, um, and uh, and there was nothing, that, as far as we know, that would lead anyone to believe that uh, that there was anything except for a discussion about adoption of the Majinsky Act. But um, I would refer you back to counsel on that one. Okay. And can I ask about counsel about Mark Kasowitz? He was um, reportedly he exchanged emails with a uh, private citizen with a, a number of threats and a profanity-laced uh, set of comments. Um, does the White House and the President still have confidence in Mr. Kasowitz to um, speak for uh, the administration on this Russian matter? Yes, he does. And I, I know Mr. Kasowitz has, has issued an apology in that matter. Zeke? Uh, thank you, John. Um, first, uh, I follow up on Joel's question there. Um, uh, he, uh, the President's tweet this morning uh, regarding uh, the Russian investigation is did Ty Cobb vet that? Could you talk a little bit about his role? Is his job here to manage the President's personal response to the Russian investigation? Uh, Mr. Cobb, you know, as you know, within the counsel's office, there are various attorneys that have different portfolios. Um, and while we have outside counsel, a lot of times the requests that we get from this room require us to go to counsel and say, can we answer this question? Uh, what, what can we say or can't we say? Um, you do your best a lot of times to, to get us to, uh, to make a case why this should be answered by the White House. And so we, we end up spending a lot of time talking to the counsel's office uh, about what can and can't be referred to outside counsel, what still remains in our purview. Uh, and so uh, it was the decision of the White House uh, to bring someone on board that, like in a lot of other areas that we have counsels dedicated to that, uh, that the, there was significant uh, interest in the subject to, to do that. Is there the case of the President's tweet this morning? Is that something that went through uh, this, uh, Mr. Cobb? I, I don't believe so. And, and what is one uh, follow on uh, Made in America? Uh, you mentioned uh, the this, this Scorsese helicopter on this park in the South Lawn that would be known as Marine One. Um, who paid for that to fly here uh, from, I guess, probably Quantico? And also, is it appropriate to use uh, military resources for a political event? Uh, well, it would be at bowling, uh, is where I believe that's held. Uh, but, you know, I think we're, we're very proud. I mean, the, the idea is to showcase this week things that are made in America. And I know uh, Sikorsky and the state of Connecticut are very proud of the fact uh, that they contribute to our national security, that there are, I, I assume, hundreds if not thousands of people whose job depends on that. And I think, uh, like most Americans, we're all proud of, of the helicopter and other military equipment that so many Americans work tirelessly to do. So, of course, it's appropriate to highlight that. Uh, Hunter. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'm wondering whether you can tell us um, if Made in America Week will include the Trump Organization or Ivanka Trump brands committing to stop manufacturing wares abroad. Say that, I'm sorry, if the... If this, as part of Made in America Week, if the Trump Organization or Ivanka Trump's brands will make any kind of commitment to stop manufacturing um, gifts, clothes, and other wares yeah. abroad. So there's a couple things that are interesting about that question. First, I think what's really important is the president's agenda, regulatory relief and tax relief, um, are focused on trying to make sure that all companies can hire here, can expand here, can manufacture here. Uh, that's something that he wants for every company, and you've seen him talk about that extensively. Um, with respect to you know his own companies, obviously it's inappropriate uh, to discuss uh, the, how anything would affect their own companies. But I can tell you that in some cases, uh, there are certain supply chains or scalability that may not be available in this country. Um, I'm not going to comment on specific products, but I will tell you that uh, the overall arching goal, of course, though, is to grow manufacturing, to grow investment here in the United States, and to grow uh, U.S. workers here. So that, that remains the, the overall objective. Uh, obviously, it might be a sacrifice <coughs> given certain questions about going rates and stuff, but wouldn't it be sort of a, a way to show leadership? To uh, again, I, it, it would be, it's not appropriate for me to stand up here and comment about a business. I, I believe you know that that's a little out of bounds. But again, I would go back to the president's broader goal, which is to create uh, investment here, to bring back the manufacturing base. And I think when you look at a lot of these indices that measure uh, confidence 
um, both in terms of CEOs, manufacturers, and uh, that, that it, it, they're all-time highs. And I think part of that is that there's a lot of confidence that the president's agenda uh, is going to accomplish that. Charlie? Uh, just a question about the DHS decision to allow 15,000 new temporary worker visas. How does that not conflict with the president's higher American message? I, again, I'll, I'll refer you to DHS on this, but I think one of the things that you're seeing through this is uh, it's not just the number; it's it's a lot of the qualifications and a lot of the uh, a lot of th that goes through there to ensure that we are hire hiring and bringing in the people. As you know, um, the president has been uh, supportive of the Raise Act by Senators Cotton and Purdue, uh, which seeks to uh, really look at it more of a merit-based immigration system, and that's something that he uh, continues to push for and will continue to work with uh, Senators Cotton and Purdue and others to to help get that. Uh, in a in a place that will focus more on merit based um, and really provide the overall reform that, that he's been talking about for a long time. Uh, Abby, um, since Friday, the president has tweeted four times about health care, but he's also tweeted six times about the U.S. Women's Open, which was held at a private property um, that is owned by his company. So the question is: Is it appropriate for him to um, essentially advertise his private business using? his um, Twitter feed and his time um, when comparatively less time is being spent on health care, an issue that, as you know, is the most important issue to Americans right now. Well, I, I respectfully disagree with that. I mean, in the sense that you sending off a tweet takes what, five, ten seconds. Um, as I just mentioned to Kristen, he's been extremely engaged throughout the weekend, making phone calls, talking to folks, meeting with his team. Um, getting updates. So to compare a tweet with a meeting or a phone call uh, of substance is probably a little... But he, spend, but he did spend a lot of his weekend back at the U.S. Women's Open and seemed to be very engaged in it. That, I mean, the tweets are perhaps a second long, but it seems to indicate what the president is spending his time on. So how do you assure the country that he actually is, in fact, engaged on health care? Um, well, I mean, look at... Look at we know where he right. Was over the weekend. He's been because I, I would suggest to you, one, I just told you um, that he's been extremely engaged in talking to different senators. I know that some of them um, have mentioned that they had extensive discussions with them. But number two, uh, this is the same group, of, you know, we, we got a lot of that it'll never get through the House. Um, we worked, he continued to work hard, he continued to be engaged then, and, and it came out. Um, we continue to do what we have to do and we'll make it work. But um, we're going to get this done, we'll go move on, we'll do tax reform, we're going to do infrastructure. The President's got a very robust agenda, and I think when you look at the amount of um, activity that he's been able to do and the results that he's getting, I think uh, that that speaks for itself. Andrew. Can I ask another American question, Sean? Yeah, Just sure. a quick one. Um, uh, Ivanka Trump's, the, the head of Ivanka Trump's business said that uh, there, it is currently not possible to make her products um, here in the United States. So what is the White House's or this administration's policy remedy for companies like that who say there's just no way to do it? How do they make their products here in America? I mean, I can't answer that question in the sense that I'm not, but, but I can tell you that it depends on the product, right? I mean, there are certain things that, certain industries that we don't do as much anymore, and there are certain things that we do do more. I mean, there's a, there's a certain thing that, um, certain aspects of technology and labor, but as I mentioned before, in terms of scalability, there are certain things um, that, that we may not have the capacity to do here in terms of having a plant or a factory that can do it. Um, the beautiful thing about uh, a capitalistic society is that if there's enough of a demand for it, uh, it will happen. And I think that's what the president's trying to do, is if you lower the tax rate, if you lower the regulatory burden, um, you know, you will hopefully grow businesses and hope grow manufacturing. I've talked to several um, CEOs and, and business leaders in the past couple of weeks about tax reform, and it's amazing how many of them tell you that they pay the 35% rate, and you say to them, what will you do if, we, if that rate drops? And the number one thing they talk about is they're going to invest and build more in their company. Um, and I think that's what we need to do. But, but some, some lines, some industries, some products um, may not have the scalability or the demand here in this country. Uh, but like so many other things, that if, if that demand um, is, if there's enough of a demand, then hopefully someone builds a factory and does it. Um, but we've seen that, you know, in your own industry where you saw um, the decline of, of newspapers, for example, and you've seen a lot of more online source, uh, online content, and online publications. That's, you know, the evolution sometimes of some industries. Um, but I'm sure somewhere around the world, the newspapers still get delivered every day, is you know, in, in, a, in a much greater way than they do here. Like, is it appropriate <laughs> if, there's, if there's no, uh, in the case of the business businesses, handbags, shirts, purses, whatever? 
if there's no capacity, is it appropriate to make those things overseas? Well, think about all of the things that we buy every day. Um, of course, there's a there's a market because we we depend um, in this country for so many goods and services, some of which are made in America, some of which aren't. Obviously, we want to create an environment in which more things are made here, more things are exported from here, um, and that's what the president's agenda sets out to do. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Uh, the Ukraine government reportedly went into damage control mode in an effort to make amends when President Trump won the election after working with the Clinton administration officials uh, to undermine its candidacy. Was this an issue that was discussed during President Poroshenko's visit to the White House in June? And has the president discussed it with us? You know, I, I actually, that's a, an interesting question. I will have to get back to you. I do, I mean, obviously there's been a lot more interest in recent days. Um, with respect to uh, what the DNC did in coordination with the Ukrainian government to try to collude and achieve a goal uh, of having someone removed, which ultimately did happen. So um, I, I don't know whether that came up with the president. Uh, I'd be glad to look into the call. I know that that story and the DNC's collusion with the Ukrainian government has definitely gotten a lot more attention since that meeting. Um, so I'm not sure that it was necessarily topical at the time. Um, but now that there's been uh, renewed interest and what the DNC did, uh, I'm glad to, to look further. Sean, what the DNC did have any impact on this administration's policies towards Ukraine? I, I don't, again, I don't, it wasn't something that was discussed at the time of the visit that I'm aware of. I'd be glad to follow up and find out whether that did come up. But again, my only point is that at the time of the visit, I don't believe it was the, the, as topical as it, was, it is now. Sean. George. Uh, at a briefing uh, last month, you said you didn't believe the president uh, factored in when he made a trip what his popularity is in that country. Now we have a uh, report of a transcript of a conversation between Prime Minister May and the President in which he asked her to quote unquote fix his popularity so he gets a better reception. Uh, do you have any reason to doubt the accuracy of that transcript that that conversation took place and do you still believe that he doesn't factor in his popularity? Uh, I, I believe that uh, I'm not going to comment on leaked, uh, rumored leaked conversations. I will say that he was pleased to accept Her Majesty's invitation and looks forward uh, to visiting the United Kingdom. Sure. Ken. North Korea, um, South Korea has offered to hold talks. Right. What's the President's view of that? And are there certain conditions that the President would like to see met before those talks? Take place. Well, obviously, those comments came out of the Republic of Korea, and I would refer you back to them. That being said, I think the president's been clear in the past uh, with respect that uh, any type of conditions uh, that would have to be met are clearly far away from where we are now. Jeff. Uh, Sean, has the White House been monitoring the demonstrations in Venezuela? Do you have any reaction to that? Um, yeah, we obviously are, are concerned uh, about that. Um, we've been watching what's been going on. We congratulate the Venezuelan people for the huge turnout in the referendum yesterday and the unmistakable statement that they made that they and that they delivered to their government. We condemn the violence inflicted by government thugs against innocent voters and efforts by the government to erode democracy in Venezuela. Uh, we once again call for the uh, Constituent Assembly of July 30th to be canceled and for free and fair elections to be scheduled. Just one follow-up yeah. on Iran. Um, a senior commander in Iran's Revolutionary Guard said today that if the United States designated the group a terrorist organization and applied new sanctions, that it would be perilous for U.S. forces in the region. Do you have a reaction to that? Uh, I don't think our forces will ever be, what was the word? Uh, peril? No. I, I think our forces are the greatest fighting machine in, in the world, and we will do everything we can to protect our country uh, and to make sure that we extinguish any threats that, uh, that we face. Thank you, guys. Hope to